we can do whatever you like. I mean, if you want us to keep like focused or something, whatever you want. Should be going. Should be going. Okay. It looks like she's going to be
All right, ladies, that was just gossiping. It's terrible. Hello, everybody. Welcome along here to the Vista Lounge. Is something completely different. Yes, one of the fabulous guest entertainers of gentlemen right here, the strapping lad, an incredible talent, and you will be seeing him later on tonight, of course, right here in this theatre. Well, he's, he's many bows to his, uh, well, his string, I suppose. I mean, if that's a terrible analogy, it really, it really is. Uh, but no, he's an incredible mathematician, as you mentioned, of course, there at this previous show. So I'm just going to say, hey, make some noise. David Klinkenberg! Oh. Hey, give it up. Give it up for this guy. Doing a great job. Carving out time for me. Um, so I'm just going to have to jump right in. People asked if I was going to be playing violin at this little presentation. And no, we don't have very much time. And we have a lot to get through. Now, how many people have seen the Dan Brown Da Vinci Code? Okay. The only thing true about that book is the title. I just want to. I just want to be clear about that in the, at the beginning. And I, I, what's interesting about the um, um, solution to the um, code is that, unfortunately, the Dan Brown novel and the and the film has taken intellectual scrutiny off what is really the true mystery of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. He definitely painted a secret message into his masterworks. That much we know for certain. Um, in fact, when you look at this image, this is the most famous image on planet Earth. This is the single most famous painting ever created. In fact, some estimates have its value currently at over a billion dollars. And how many of you have been to the Louvre? Look at What's the first thing that you notice about the Mona Lisa? It is small. It is small. You hardly can see it through the sea of, what, heads that you're behind. And so many people have seen it, and yet very few people ever have noticed what the central anomaly is of this painting. There is something in this painting that absolutely demands an explanation. And of all the books and documents and, and novels and films and web pages that have been devoted to this image, there's only one place where I have ever seen anyone pinpoint what the real mystery is, and it was here. It was the curator at the Louvre. She was asked about the painting, and this is what she had to say. Hopefully we have some volume on this. He was very, very, very busy. He had commissions, he started paintings, he didn't finish them. He went on to something else, traveled. Remember that traveling took a long time. He took the Mona Lisa with him, wherever he went, and he left work unfinished all the time. He said he took the Mona Lisa with him wherever he went? It, it, we know that the Mona Lisa traveled with him. It's one of the paintings that traveled, uh, that he liked to have with him. Okay, if you tell me that Da Vinci hand carried the Mona Lisa with him everywhere, I want to know why. Was he protecting something bigger than the painting itself? The Mona Lisa features a seated woman with a subtle smile. This seemingly simple image is possibly the most widely recognized and studied piece of art in the history of the world. It's estimated to be worth more than $700 million. But could there be more to this painting than meets the eye? This isn't a novel. Could the Mona Lisa be the key to crack a code that spans Da Vinci's life's work? There's water in the background of the Mona Lisa, isn't there? That's right, yes. Because so there's lower water on one side and higher water on the other. There are different kinds of landscapes and there is a figure in the middle, so that the, the, they don't combine completely if you remove the figure. If you remove the figure, there would be a deluge of water from one side to the other. The background of the Mona Lisa looks like a beautiful nature scene. But look closer. The water is clearly higher on one side than the other, as though a flood is inevitable. And here's the thing, if you pull the Mona Lisa out of the painting, the waters come crashing together. The only thing stopping the flood is the alleged self-portrait. So again, we have to ask, could the Mona Lisa be part of a larger story? Okay, did you guys catch that? So, like most uh, things, he still gets it a little bit wrong. If you do look back here in the background, you can see that the image is split into two halves, the background. There's the mountain half and the valley half. And in the mountain half, he's painted these giant bodies of water. Do you see that? And you also can see that there's this pathway clearly leading from the lake 
into the valley where the seated figure is positioned. So the Mona Lisa is sitting there staring at you with a very particular look on her face. It's been called sort of a smile, but it's not a smile, is it? What is the look on her face? It's a smirk. And a smirk is very, very different than a smile. A smile conveys happiness, a smile conveys a number of things, but a smirk conveys a very specific expression. And the reason why this painting is so small is that he carried with him everywhere he went. For the last 15 years of his life, he was obsessed about getting that expression just right. And the expression of his smirk conveys a message everywhere in the world. It's interesting about life because we have different words for things, we have different colloquials, we have different um, expressions all over the world, different languages, but facial expressions remain the same everywhere and throughout time. And this facial expression was meant to convey something very specific. A smirk says, I know something you don't. And Leonardo da Vinci was absolutely obsessed with getting this expression right. So she knows something you don't. And yet she's clearly about to be the victim of a gigantic flood. Do you see that? That is certainly not an accident. And it is this central anomaly that demands an explanation. In order to understand what da Vinci's message was, we really do have to start a long, long time ago. This is a timeline of the entire history of Homo sapiens. There are three main events that I want to pinpoint on this timeline. Uh, about 42,000 years ago, archaeologists and anthropologists have pinpointed an event that occurred in the history of Homo sapiens called the Cognitive Revolution. This, this point in time is so specific that before the Cognitive Revolution, there's no art ever discovered anywhere on the planet. No paintings, no sculpting, no jewelry, no musical instruments, nothing that you could ever call art was created before this time. And after this time, an explosion of everything we know of as art happened seemingly overnight. And it's called the Cognitive Revolution because subsequent to this event, Homo sapiens had been kind of uh, subject to a particular area of the Earth, Sub-Saharan Africa, and we went up the coastline, and a very small portion of the Earth Homo sapiens um, inhabited. After this, they exploded out of their ancestral territory and quickly took the planet, our ancestors did. Then we have the agricultural revolution. That's when we learned how to tame animals and domesticate plants. Then we have history. That's when we learned how to write things down. And the oldest document that we've ever found is the instructions of Shuripak and it dates to 2600 BC. So that marks the beginning of the historical record. Um, Warner Herzog does a documentary where he puts it a particular way, but we can skip that because we got a lot to get through. So the very first thing that Homo sapiens ever did was create paintings. This is what marks the cognitive revolution. Are you with me so far? Okay. And this is called Lascaux Cave. Lascaux Cave was discovered in 1924 by lost school children. They were playing hooky from school and they wandered in to what was considered one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of the 20th century. And it contains hundreds and hundreds, 1,500 paintings of animals. Many of these animals are life-size. Humans come up to about the belly of this cow. This is called the Grand Hall. It's an absolutely extraordinary hall of paintings. In fact, after it was discovered, Picasso went to the cave and left exclaiming that the art of painting had not progressed in 20,000 years. And when modern science got a hold of these paintings, they discovered something really quite extraordinary. We thought that this was just a, a huge set of extraordinary paintings until recently. Do you guys see these dots up here? Can you see that? The dots? Do you see these dots on the cow's face here? Do you see those? And then over the, uh, over that bull's nose, do you see those hash marks? You guys see all that? Okay, good. Those were totally overlooked. Literally until about 10 years ago. Until our science caught up with what they were doing 20,000 years ago. See, we didn't know that there was a biological relationship between the sun and the moon. 
We didn't know that there was a lunar component to the herding and mating and foaling and migrating patterns of wild animals, to the hatching of insects, to the flowering of plants. The entire biosphere we now know acts as a gigantic grandfather clock whose downbeat is kept by the sun and the moon. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but human physiology and behavior is traceable against the sun and the moon as well. They've done global studies since we found this out in 2007. Global studies on human behavior and found a perfect lunar rhythm in the patterns of suicides and homicides worldwide. They take a perfect lunar rhythm. They found a perfect 29 and a half day rhythm in the fluctuations of hemolymph in honeybees. And this goes throughout the entire biosphere. We now know that you can track migrating patterns of fish against the sun and the moon. We used to track them by dolphin fins, looking to see when the, we could spot dolphin fins in the bays. And that just shifted recently to tracking them against the sun and the moon. And what we actually ended up finding here was that hunters and gatherers in Lascaux Cave were tracking animal behaviors against the sun and the moon so that they could more easily target them. This wasn't just paintings, it was science. It was thousands of years that this paint, that this cave was being painted of tracking these animal patterns. It was a university of knowledge. And they went back into the cave systems and found, lo and behold, they weren't just tracking animal behaviors, they also had mapped the entire night sky into the paintings as well, embedded them in some of the animals. That's why when we see like, you guys are familiar with astrological signs like the Taurus and the Pisces, why does not the Pisces look anything like fish? Has anyone seen that astrological sign? It's just two triangles and, a, and some dots. The reason why it's associated with fish is because not that it looked like a fish, because they were tracking that constellation against fish migrations tens of thousands of years ago. This is where those sign patterns first emerged. I would like to focus your attention on this particular one. Um, this is actually one of the animals and dot patterns that allowed scientists to make the initial breakthrough. In fact, it was my dad is a biologist. He worked for the energy department his entire career. And uh, he's also a bow hunter. And his colleague was the biologist who made the initial breakthrough, who was also a bow hunter. And my dad had always denied always grown up going bow hunting in Eastern Oregon and with all my uncles and they always knew that there was a lunar component to animal behavior because they were always very superstitious about it. When there was a full moon, my uncle would know to go someplace different. He goes, well, it's a full moon tonight, so we're going to go here. They kind of had this sort of instinct for it, but my dad's friend went back into the cave systems and noticed, do you see these dots down here? And then they culminate in this sort of circle of dots here. Do you see that? And then the dots go on. What he discovered was that they were tracking, these are just months of the year. They were just counting from the winter solstice to when this horse was colored in this particular way. And that was the window of time during which it was colored in this particular way. And then they would track it forward. Now, this is Lascaux Cave in Southern France, okay? This is the migratory pattern that humans took after they made this discovery. They exploded out of their ancestral territory here, as I told you, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and quickly took the planet. And we know the path they took. They came over here, crossed the Bering Strait. This is probably eighth grade review, right? 15,000 BC. We actually have, have altered this timeline a little because we found an artifact down here in Brazil about two years ago that was 13,000 years old. We know it was 13,000 years old because it was a carving of a mastodon. And those went extinct over 13,000 years ago, so they know that humans must have at least gotten to here about 13,000 years ago. And they finally, at the very last migration, they finally made it all the way down to Patagonia. This was the last place on Earth that humans migrated to as, as far as the major continents go. And you can see why because we started way over there and had to walk all the way over here, okay? How many people have been to Ushuaia? See, this what's great about doing these on cruise ships. You've been everywhere, okay? When you get off the ship, do you notice there's a sign that says Delphine del Mundo? You know what that means? The end of the world. And it means that because it is the last place that humans ever found on planet Earth. It's also the southernmost city on planet Earth, Ushuaia. Well, 
I was there recently, and when humans finally made their way there, they painted a cave called the Cave of Hands. Is anybody familiar with that? See, most people didn't know. It's a little ways from Ushuaia. It's not particularly touristy. Not many people go there. But it's really one of the most extraordinary archaeological sites in South America. And it dates to around seven to 9,000 BC, the Cave of Hands. It's the first thing humans did when they made their way down there. They painted a cave. And I was just there, as I said, and I was astonished when I snapped this photo. Now, when you put these two images together, does anybody notice the relationship? Is it just me? <laughs> Human beings had kept that knowledge of how to track animal behaviors against the sun and the moon. And they had taken that knowledge with them the entire time. It's not just thousands and thousands of miles, but it's also over 10,000 years they had kept that information. And they were doing it in the exact same way. In fact, these aren't the only two paintings that are similar between Lascaux and the Cave of Hands. This is a painting from Lascaux Cave. You can see it's a hunting scene. And they had the calculations of when they could more effectively hunt these animals. Here is from the Cave of Hands. Here's a painting from Lascaux Cave. See the handprint? Here's from the Cave of Hands. They used to think that Lascaux Cave was the oldest cave system that we had ever found of paintings in it. They were the oldest paintings known at the time, until a few years afterwards, they discovered another cave system in um, France called Chauvet Cave. And just recently, Warner Herzog, you know Warner Herzog, the documentarian? Okay, he's not that great. Well, <laughs> anyway, he did a, a big documentary on this cave called uh, Chauvet Cave. And they just put cameras in it for the very first time. And I snapped this photo from that documentary. I was kind of surprised myself at this one. You can even see that on this one, they put all 12 dots of the lunar calendar next to the image. We think, I think, that we know what this handprint represents, in fact. It's, um, a, uh, they counted the digits on the hand, so it's also a counting mechanism, the hand principle. This isn't the only astonishing image from Chauvet Cave, though. I'd like to focus on this one. This is really quite uh, a significant um, uh, find here. You can see um, th th these, these images are, are incredibly well painted. This is 32,000 years ago. And these are rhinos. Can you see that? And this one is kind of agitated. They painted it specifically so you could almost feel the, the, the motion and the emotion in, in the painting. But you can see these two here pretty much easily squaring off. Do you see that? And we know exactly when this happens. It happens during the fall mating season, when rhinos are competing for mates. Okay? We know that today. But look right here in the middle. I'll highlight that so you can see it. Do you see that? When you count these, you can clearly see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then that could be half of one or another one, 10. What is nine to 10 months from the winter solstice? It puts you right in the September, October mating season when these animals are behaving this way. Do you see that? Really an extraordinary um, uh, uh, example of what the biologists have now found. This is 32,000 years old, and it's not just paintings. They were tracking animal behavior against the sun and the moon. This next image is also quite significant. You can see the calculations, but these are cave lines. In fact, this is the only image we have of cave lines. They didn't even know. Scientists didn't know whether cave lines even had manes until they discovered this image. They can see that they don't. This is the male. That's the female. They're definitely in the mating ritual because the female is angry. <laughs> yeah, I'm not making that up. That's just the way it is. <laughs> and you can see that they've done the calculations. Do you see this? They usually embed them in the animals somewhere um, also. So they believe that these were the oldest paintings ever discovered on planet Earth until about a few years ago. When in Borneo, in Indonesia, where I was about a year ago, um, tracking this down, they found an image that dates to around 39,000 BC, and it's called a deer pig. 
Now, it's an extinct animal, deer pig, and it's a really fascinating looking animal, and this is an image of the cave. Now, just so you know, I didn't do that. It almost looks Photoshop, doesn't it? Like I'm going around doing this. No, they were using the same exact imagery to track these animals all over the world. And they thought that this was the oldest animal ever discovered until about a few months ago. This is updating pretty quickly. I now have scientists from around the world who are emailing me about this subject because we really are the first people. I, I am, because I'm my dad's son, he happened to know the guy, and the guy published this book and never did anything else with it. He only published a, a, the proof, but he didn't trace it around the world. So I was the first person to be going around the world looking for these. And this is now the oldest image discovered on planet Earth. This dates to right to the doorstep of the revolution, 40,000 years ago, 40,000 BC, I mean 42,000 years ago. And you can see here's the animal. You see the feet, this one's a little bit more. And here's the body, there's the head, and there it is. But look it up here in the right corner. It's absolutely remarkable. And what this is indicating to the scientists and anthropologists around the world, and this is the punchline, is that hunters and gatherers, our ancestors, Homo sapiens, didn't live in small scavenging bands. Even just 10 years ago, we thought, the anthropologists of the world thought that our ancestors, tens of thousands of years ago, lived like wolves, like coyotes. That's the way they thought. Very small, 20 to 100 maybe at the most, groups of families, totally independent from one another, living like scavenging wolves. That picture has been completely overturned. Homo sapiens after the cognitive revolution didn't take the planet, our ancestors didn't take the planet from the Neanderthals and the other hominids by becoming all of a sudden faster and stronger. They did it because they were more organized and they knew how to track animal behaviors against the sun and moon. This gave them a distinct advantage in the wild. And they came together and they organized how to take the planet as a group. And they developed a government structure that we now know is much more sophisticated than the one that we had anticipated. In fact, this same pattern of handprints have been now found in cave systems all over the world, the exact same leading us to the conclusion that this was more likely the structure of the government of our ancestors of tens of thousands of years ago of Homo sapiens. We know that they had tribal families. We know that they had tribal elders. You've all heard of that. And we also know that they had clans. Has anyone heard of the clan? Has anyone watched Game of Thrones? Okay. The clan governed dozens of separate tribes under a single council. Every tribe sent a delegate to the clan meeting. If you've heard of Vikings, you, if you've seen any of these shows on the History Channel, you're familiar with the clan. But it didn't end there. We thought it might have ended there, but it didn't. The clan sent a delegate to a national council, which governed dozens of clans. And it was much more powerful and able to govern these clans over very long periods of time. The national council sent a delegate to a regional council which it looks like there may have been 12 of all over the world. The regional council sent a delegate to a central council. The central council governed the affairs of every homo sapien, every hunter and gatherer in the world. This government structure explains what I'm about to show you as the pattern of data. The, the reason why we know that this was more likely the government structure of ancient homo sapiens is because of the patterns not just in the cave paintings, which is really quite extraordinary, but in the archeology, span symbology, and mythologies of the world. So we're gonna start with that. This is how we know that there were national and regional councils, okay? Not just clan and tribal councils. It's the archeology span that they like. This is um, an image from Southern Illinois. I don't know, but I used to live just north of here in Chicago. This is where I grew up, Chicago. And this was just south of my uh, home. Well, a few, like 100 miles, a bit south of my home, right across from St. Louis. And you can see there's a car down there, it's a highway. People used to pass this year after year after year for decades and just thought it was a hill. But archeologists recently have excavated this hill. This is what it looked like, looks like today. But this is what archeologists believe that this looked like in its day. And it was constructed by hunters and gatherers. Cahokia was a 2,200 acre cultural